Hi, it's David Aver with the Customer Experience Advantage podcast. On today's show, a fascinating conversation with Stephanie Stuckey, the granddaughter of the founder of the Familiar Stop along the highways and byways of America. So how do you revive an iconic and nostalgic brand after decades of neglect? Stick around and we'll find out right after this. You're listening to the Customer Experience Advantage podcast with David Averin. Featuring candid conversations with some of the most influential leaders in business today. Sit back and listen in, or feel free to watch the video version online. This is the Customer Experience Advantage Podcast, and here's David Averin. Hey, boomers. Actually, as my kids always say, okay, boomer. It's David Averin with the Customer Experience Advantage Podcast. And today, oh my gosh, what a fun show we've got today. If you are, this is for my boomer friends and anybody else who... Uh, who has any nostalgia. I hear others say, no, I remember that because you post things on social media and others. And here's all the boomer things that we remember. And those kids, our kids today who are like, oh, I'm bored. Really? Spend four hours with a light bright on New Year's Eve. And, and, you know, but if you remember, uh, you know, dippity do and jiffy pop popcorn and your parents making you take cod liver oil, or the sting of Bactine, or what was the other one, Mercurochrome, remember that? You got a, an owie on your knee or something else as well. Or when you went to a pizza place and there were cigarette machines right by the door and anybody could do that, you're gonna love today's episode because we're gonna talk a little nostalgia, but of course we're gonna talk business and customer experience and how do you, how do you revive an iconic brand? How do you make it more than just nostalgia? How do you make it more than just kitsch? to something that's an actual profitable venture. That is the Herculean, is that the right word? Herculean task taken on by our guest today, Stephanie Stuckey from famous Stuckey's restaurant, the roadside uh, pecan rolls and everything else. I'm gonna let you introduce yourself a little bit here, but I remember, um, I was gonna say driving the highways and byways, but no, it was actually being a kid in the back of the station wagon as we mm -hmm. did road trips. We drove across the country from our home in Denver, Colorado, all the way to the East Coast and everywhere along the highway it was those iconic signs, the big yellow sign for Stuckey's and the 99 cent breakfast with the eggs and toast and jelly, I think it was, but you remember Two eggs, toast and jam, king of the road, breakfast set special, 99 cents. 99, what a bargain. I was no, a loss leader. I don't even yeah. know what that, I was going to say, I don't even know what that is in today's dollars, but, but that's what it was, right? And, and there was a time yeah. that along Route 66, they were everywhere. And of course they yeah. had the challenges. So we are talking to Stephanie Stuckey. Stephanie, um, is the granddaughter of the founders of Stuckey's Restaurant, famous along the highways and byways of America. Um, her, it, it fell out of, out of uh, family hands for some time. I'm gonna let her tell about that. But quick background for her, she was a, a state representative in Georgia for 14 years, a trial attorney. She was appointed by the, by the mayor of Atlanta as the chief resilience officer and more. But one year ago, depending on when you're listening or watching this podcast, she took over the helm as CEO of Stuckey's Restaurant. Stephanie, thanks for being with us here on the podcast. I'm delighted. Thank you for having me. So I've had a great time following your journey. I don't know who had recommended. Yeah. Somebody had sent me a post and said, you got to see what um, this amazing leader is doing. As she's driving around the country, visiting all of the sites. <laughs> You know, I think in, in a warehouse standpoint, people talk about it as management by walking around and you're sort of leading by driving yeah. around and getting a sense. Tell me about the journey. Tell me about a little bit about your past, how you came to where you are and, and where you are today. Well, thank you. That's I uh, really appreciate all the memories that you've revived. And it's not just the boomer generation. I'm, I guess I'm the neglected Gen X generation and Gen Xers definitely remember those road trips. And I'm number four or five kids. We had the Woody station wagon and I was low on the pecking order. So I was in the way, way back. Yeah, no seatbelts. Yeah, the air conditioning yeah. didn't go. <laughs> I, I never saw, I never got shotgun until the older kids went off to college. So that, I had that experience too. If you grew up during the 70s taking road trips. We but, you, but you were far enough in the back that your parents couldn't reach back to smack you when somebody right? was misbehaving, you were just out of that parent reach for that. 
Yeah, my my dad actually had a fly swatter, so trying to get a little bit further, <laughs> and he would still have like fly guts on it. So we were all like, "Oh my gosh, we're gonna behave." So yeah, and nobody had seatbelts. No. <laughs> That no, was we like would do, and we would do, and we would stop at stoplights and do Chinese fire drills, which I know is very racist today, but that's what they called them in the day. Yeah. And nobody had helmets or whatever else, but um, but we remember that. What was your yeah. childhood like with a name like Stuckies or Smuckers or Disney? It had yeah. to be like a brand on you. But what was that like growing up as, as part of that dynasty? I think I was very lucky and that I did not grow up with this inflated sense of my family. My grandfather sold the company in 1964, a year before I was born. Okay. And so it was out of family hands throughout my childhood. Now, having said that, I knew my grandfather. He remained involved in the company for about a decade. And so we were still, the family was still involved. I certainly knew the stores. I think what was different growing up at Stucky is when we, we went on a road trip. We never had to beg our parents to stop at Stuckey's. I hear stories from people who said, oh, my parents would never stop or they wouldn't let us get a pecan log roll. We stopped at every one. Oh, I can imagine. So I guess that's that's the main difference. But we, I was, I'm from Eastman, Georgia, a small town where we were founded. The company was founded. But we moved when I was a year old. My dad got elected to Congress. I grew up in Washington, D.C. I went to school there even though I spent my summers and every other year, my dad was up for re-election, so we were always campaigning. But I grew up in DC. And so my classmates were the kids of politicians from all over the country, diplomats and military. That, that's what you find in the District of Columbia. So they didn't know Stucky. So it was, and, and I, I went to, you know, in DC, I went to school with Roosevelt's and, Kennedy's. Uh, so different kind of dynasty. Yeah, Stucky, come on, Stucky was not a big deal compared to those names. So did not have a big inflated sense of self. But having said that, I do have a lot of pride in my grandfather and what he did. And I was very blessed to have known him. I was 12 when he passed away. So talk about the gap. Talk about what happened yeah. to the brand yeah, we had a big gap. during the time when it when it fell out of family hands. It was purchased by another organization. Yeah, uh, and as we've seen oftentimes, that that family pride uh, is is lost oftentimes in in a different corporate model. What happened to the brand during that time? I think this is very much a cautionary tale for brands that are family run, and you're looking maybe to sell. Maybe this is what not to do. I, I will give a very quick background on the company founded yeah, in seven by my grandfather William. And Sylvester Stuckey. Everyone called him Stuckey. And he was a product of the Depression. A lot of great businesses were founded during economic hard times. So that's another Absolutely. really important lesson. Microsoft is one that is really at the top of the list, but Target, uh, Revlon, a lot of them. So we were founded during the Depression out of economic necessity. My grandfather had to drop out of college, was taking a bunch of odd jobs. And we live in the heart of pecan or pecan country, however you want to say it, in the middle of Georgia. So he started selling pecans on the side of the road for extra money and then asked my grandmother to help him make some candy. He thought that might sell. My grandfather, my grandmother did not know how to make candy, but she had six sisters. So they got in the kitchen and figured out how to make and I've got props for those of you who can see our iconic pecan log roll, which we're known for. Of course. So she started making divinity fudge pralines and that took off and that grew into a store that grew into three stores that grew into a candy plant, a billboard company, a trucking company. And at our peak, 368 stores in almost 40 states everywhere, but really the Pacific Northwest. So an amazing story of a man who came from nothing and had a vision. So you see that with family run companies, you've got the visionary founder, then you've got the second generation that will often continue it. Then you got the third generation, often the generation that screws it up. <laughs> I want to defy that logic. Or, or, or the one or the one that 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 modernizes it other than the one that wants to yeah. honor the past and look at there. But before we go into all of that, talk about 
the, the shift in America. We had sort of the uh, the back roads, the Route 66. Yeah. And along, and then with the the advent of the internet, in, um, the um, interstate highway system, I almost said internet yeah. there, the interstate highway system, uh, it took a lot of the cars off the road, didn't it? Yeah, so uh, it's very interesting. My past, although I did not grow up in the business, I think a lot of my experiences are relevant to what I'm doing today. Chief Resilience Officer for City of Atlanta, was great training yeah. for my role now. You have to be resilient with a business, uh, especially a family business. I will say the resilience position was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. It grew out of me being head of sustainability. So it was really working with cities, but partners for cities. So it was working with businesses and nonprofits and community-based groups on how to adapt and respond and be even stronger as a result of the impacts of climate change. So taking that resilience yeah. experience into Stuckey's has been helpful. And also looking at how my grandfather was resilient. And a great example is how he dealt with the highway system. So Stuckey's was founded before there were interstates. We were on the back roads of America. We were on the state routes, old US Route 1, uh, Highway 341 in Georgia. So we were on these side roads and there were a lot of businesses like ours that cater to the traveling public, but they were small, mostly mom and pop shops. 19, I guess 53, Eisenhower passed the Interstate Highway Act. Interstate highway system was pretty much complete by 58. My grandfather could have done what a lot of companies did when you have a total shift in your company that threatens to demolish your brand completely. And a lot of companies are are faced with that with a variety of external factors. My grandfather, instead of shutting down, used it as an opportunity for growth and to actually come back stronger. That is the very definition of resilience, the ability to rebound and rebound in a way that makes you stronger as a result of that challenge. So what he did was prior to the highway system, his stores were just a hodgepodge. He built a store here or there, there was no consistency in the look or the design. This gave him an opportunity to rebuild in a very strategic way. So he had all his stores look the same and not just the same, he had the design of the stores be part of the marketing. So you referenced that earlier, I, that this classic teal roof that a lot of people will remember that was sloped and yep. he had the signs and actually I have, I'm doing sort of a throwback and a look forward with how I'm rebranding the company. I just happen to have these because I'm working on my boxes today. Yeah. But this what he did the the billboards along with the stores. And he would he really revolutionized. He was right there with the Burma Shave Company and at the founding of billboards along the highways in this country. So accompanying his stores were the billboards, and he was strategic about how he cited his stores. I love the story about him. And it just shows boots on the ground learning. Even if he wasn't able to finish college because of the depression, he was a quick learner and he was self-taught in how to run re roadside retail. So he figured out how far apart to space his stores, which is important. Yeah, absolutely. Got in his car and he would drink a cup of coffee. And when he needed to pull over, that's how far apart he would space them. So what was lost? That works during... today, by the way. Yeah, yeah I absolutely. I always said if he had just had me in the car with him, we would have had like 200 more stores. I was going to say they'd be like, yeah, yeah. same with my wife, would be far closer together than they even are now. Yeah. So in that every, time. Every 50 miles, let's pull over. <laughs> in that time that, that it was, after it was purchased, what was lost? Yeah, so he's, like I said, he sold in 64 because, and I think this is often why companies sell, you're not able to, you're, you, there's, you experience rapid growth. How do right. you manage that growth? You can right. bring in more partners or you can sell. And he sold. Yeah, it it's, it's old Marshall problem. Goldsmith, what got you here won't get you there. And, and yeah. oftentimes, even, even in Silicon Valley, you see that in some of this, this, this energy around a startup and we're going to be that company that does, and then all of a sudden you got big growth and, and, and the, the HR systems yeah. and the management philosophy and the laissez-faire, you know, everybody work from home, everybody be creative. It becomes a little bit unwieldy at that point, doesn't it? That and how do you maintain the culture as you dramatically grow? 
he was a country boy and right. that's who he hired. Half of Eastman, Georgia was employed by Stuckey's. Right. And so, so, half so who of the bought Stuckey it and, and, what, and what did they do with it? What, what did he do with the company? So, so who bought it and what did they do with the company? Okay, so at the time it seemed to make sense. So that's another thing is really be careful about who you sell to. It's got to be a brand that gets you. And he sold to a St. Louis based dairy company, Pet Dairy. And they make evaporated milk, condensed milk. And at the time they owned Whitman's samplers. Oh, so yeah. they had a candy company. It seemed like a compatible brand. They made my grandfather head of the Stuckey's division of Pet Dairy Corporation. So initially it sounded like a really good partnership. The stores expanded. My grandfather remained head of the division. He was on the pet board. Then the CEO who brought my grandfather on died unexpectedly of a heart attack in his forties. Another unanticipated crisis. The new CEO did not get Stuckey's and pushed us out, pushed my grandfather out. My grandfather sadly died a year later and it was just a perfect storm of bad events. We had the Arab oil embargo. So that was really the demise of the road trip. Stuckey's is, we, we were at our peak when the Great American Road Trip was at its peak. Right. And when the road trip declined, we started declining for a variety of factors. And then Pet got bought out in a hostile takeover by, I even hate to say their name, it's like Voldemort for me because they just trashed the brand, but it was a Chicago railroad conglomerate, IC Industries. There, I said it, I'm not gonna say their name again. And they just saw us, this is where corporate buyouts don't make sense. Yeah. They weren't in it for the long haul. They didn't get the brand. They saw us as an investment. We, they weren't, this was not a long-term growth acquisition for them. And they sold a lot of the assets, the stores plummeted, the brand plummeted. Uh, it, it, was, it was tragic. Yeah. I so when, remember when, when driving you're... by our old stores and seeing them shuttered, seeing them turn yeah. into porn shops oh. because we were on the interstate. We were right outside of often city limits. So a lot of the zoning laws related to adult entertainment did not apply. And truckers like to stop at these sex shops on the interstate. Stuckey's was perfect location. And there are quite a few of our old locations that are porn shops and it just broke my heart. I mean, that is not right. my father's vision. So, so when your father so. um, finished his term in, in Congress and didn't run for reelection and came back home, yeah. what was the condition of the company when he took it over? And tell me a little bit about that journey. And I really want to get into your journey and sort of your plans for the brand. But tell me about what, what he took over. What did he face at the time? Yeah, so my father had a, a fascinating career and he's still very much with us, gets up at 5 a.m. every day and texts me and makes sure I'm up and working, which which I am. We, we've all been early risers. My grandfather, my dad and I were all up at 5 a.m. working yeah. and or maybe drinking my coffee and contemplating my day. I may not actually get working for another hour or two, but my father was in Congress for 10 years, left politics like I did. And my grandfather was in the state house. We all left by not running for re-election. So it's the best way to, to run. Yeah, Leave absolutely. before they get tired of you. <laughs> we very much have a tradition of public service as a service, and it's not a career. And you do it short term, you make your contribution, but none of us thought it should be a career. And so my dad left in 1976. He was looking for his next move. And it was really brilliant what he did. He went to the president of American Dairy Queen Corporation and said, Dairy Queens aren't on the interstate highway system. I can do that for you. I, he grew up around the business. He had worked in the business with my grandfather before Stuckey's was sold out. So he knew yeah. roadside retail. And he bought the franchise rights for Dairy Queens on the interstate highway system. He, he created that company, he ran that company, he was a phenomenal success with that. So every Dairy Queen store you see on the interstate highway system, that's thanks to my father. I will pay more attention to it. Yeah, 
So he was doing that. He also had a timber company. He, he owns a local bank. My, my father and my, my grandfather shared this. My grandfather had a bunch of businesses too. So you see this with entrepreneurs, right? They're serial entrepreneurs. They, it's almost like a fix, right? A, like an addict. You got to have another business. So they, they all had side hustles. My dad, Dairy Queen was really his business. He was running that successfully, had been when the company that owned Stucky said, we're losing money. They were getting sued by franchisees. They wanted to get out of the litigation and they pretty much gave the company to my dad in 1985. My dad took it on, but he was running Dairy Queen. That was where he was making his profit. So he came up with Stucky's Express, which very much made sense at the time. He started co-branding. You pull over to Dairy Queen, he put his Stuckies next to it. So he, existing Stuckies, he put his Dairy Queens or some of his Dairy Queens, he would add his Stuckies. And then he would also go to other travel centers on the highway and say, for a modest franchise fee, give us 250, 500 square feet footprint within your store and we'll create a branded Stucky section. And that was Stuckies Express. He was co-branding in the 1980s before most companies were doing that. Yeah, so you, see, you see a lot of that small. today, right? And there's and there sort of yeah. this complementary, but not yeah. um, Compliment. competitive, right? Brands within it, uh, same audience, yeah. but, but, but not competing. I mean, you see that now, well, you'll see with, with, with you know, Yum Brands and others doing it with, with KF, makes a lot with of Taco sense. Bell and things like that, but sort of the store within the store, you almost see a version of that now with the proudly serving Starbucks and others within within. Oh yeah, brands. yeah. And and that makes a lot of sense. Here's a lesson learned from that. It requires constant mo management and supervision of your brand. You can risk having your brand diluted if you right. are with the wrong partner. And while it made sense at the time, that concept now is a challenge for me. So just from, a, from a brand integrity perspective, in brand of, integrity. Yeah. In, in terms of having the standards saying, this is how it will be displayed. This is how it will always yeah. look. And then holding them accountable. You saw that in the movie that came out recently. What was it? The, uh, the founder, right. With uh, yeah. about, about the founding of McDonald's, same thing as yeah. he's got this, this vision Love for that. it. And then he goes and somebody else is selling chicken. Somebody else is doing it. like, Hey, right. And especially as you're yeah. geographically dispersed, managing and monitoring those those dispersed locations yeah. are a challenge isn't it and it's more of a challenge so mcdonald's is a franchise stuckey's is franchise too but if you have a standalone store you really control what's in that store by virtue of the franchise agreement if you are a store within a store you can control your section within that store but you can't control the overall store so if we're in and i'm not like a pilot, but I'm not citing pilot as a bad example, but if you're in a pilot, I can't tell pilot how to run the rest of the look and feel of their store. I can only have a say in the branded Stucky section. Right. right. So, and, and, and that that's the integration, that guilt by association can be a challenge. All right. So in your father, was, so, so as he took over the company and facing a very different world than what your grandfather had had, what did, how did that vision, and, and tell me about the process of you take, making a really yeah. big shift in your career. Total shift. Uh, but the other thing is my father chose not to buy the candy plant, which I respect, but unfortunately what happened is the company that bought the candy plant, which by the way is the same family that makes Goo Goo Clusters, a brand I absolutely love, and we oh. sell a lot of Goo Goo Clusters at Stuckey's. But it was that same family, the Spradley family. They ran the former Stuckey's candy plant, made the candy for us, but they sold about a decade ago. Well, they, they shut the plant down about a decade ago and it's now completely shuttered. So we lost the candy plant, which is unfortunate. Uh, but my dad successfully ran Stuckey's really with, like I said, Dairy Queen being his primary focus. And Warren Buffett bought my dad's Dairy Queen company a decade ago. Warren Buffett owns American Dairy Queen. Perfect compliment, right? Absolutely. So my dad, his partners financially did very well by selling to Warren Buffett. 
it's a testament to what a great businessman he was that an investor like Warren Buffett would be interested in his company. So they pretty much close up shop and go home and they leave a skeleton crew running Stuckies. And there was no CEO, there was no strategic plan, there was no marketing budget. It was just basically two people, a distribution center with a handful of employees and um, three sales reps. How many franchise locations at this time? And how many companies? At company that time, owned? there were a, a, a little over 100. Today, there were 67. Okay. So fast forward to last year, so about a decade since the company had been sold, my dad's former partners are sitting on Stucky stock. What are we going to do with this? And it's interesting you mentioned Pan Am. That's one route for nostalgic brands that have fallen on hard times. You can just sell the company for essentially the brand, the trademark. So you put it on merchandise. So that's what they were looking at. They did have some prospective buyers that would have just bought the trademark and slapped the Stucky logo on some t-shirts and hats. And no one in my family was interested in the business. And I, I really, if you, so this is, this is a, a, a reference to a cultural, pop cultural reference to our era. Remember the life cereal commercial with Mikey? Hey, yeah. he likes it. Hey, Mikey. Yeah. Yeah. Like the older siblings don't want this cereal. What's this? We don't want it. You know, they keep passing along. Well, give it to Mikey. Mikey, Mikey. Right. Will... I'm Mikey. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I'm the younger sibling. Give it to Stephanie. She'll, she'll take it. And yeah, I worked my whole life. I had savings. I was able to, to buy it. I consulted three financial advisors. Two said, don't buy it. The third said, buy it. And why I listened to the third, the two that said, no, we're looking strictly at the financials. And it's right. true. We had been losing money for five years. The past five years, we've been losing money. And we lost money because we lost one big account that had been having that uh, uh, the the travel center space is ex is constantly shifting roadside yeah, and very competitive. Roadside chains are constantly getting bought out. I mean, every week you hear, you know, Flying J was bought out by truck. Travel Centers of America by TA, Travel Centers of America, right. it's constantly being bought out. So we were in one of those chains, Wilco, that got bought out by Speedway, that then got bought out by Pilot. So we lost our biggest account and we're no longer profitable. So the strong lesson there, I took to heart immediately, diversify your revenue streams. Yeah. You can't afford to take another hit like Pilot. So the person who told me, I should invest in Stuckies. And the reason I did it was he said, there's something that's not on the books. And so when you're looking at financial statements for nostalgic brands, keep in mind what's not on the books. Brand loyalty, nostalgia, the value of your customers who've had decades of good experiences with your brand. And I knew that brand loyalty. And... So I said, I'm going to do it. And I also sentimental. It was sentimental. Sure. You know, that saying it's not, it's not personal. It's business. I turned that upside down. No, it, it is personal and it's business and it's very personal. It's my name up on those billboards and it's my grandfather's legacy. And I very much had feel a strong connection to wanting to revive what he created. Well, clearly a lot of people feel that connection as well. As you go to the website for, for Stuckey's right now, great rebranding. I mean, great yeah. refresh of the brand, great colors and merchandise. Thank but you. I, I, but I saw 11 pages of people's personal anecdotes just since August 1st of people who love, who love that. But see, but how do you balance that? Because you look at other iconic brands like, Oldsmobile is gone. It's not coming back. Sears is tired. It, it's gone. It's 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 not coming back. But even from a restaurant world, there's how I, I was looking this up online. House of Pies and Ponderosa and Big Boy and Bonanza and Mr. Oh. Steak and, and Sambo's, which is a little racist as well. Yeah, yeah, Red yeah. Barn, uh -huh. Howard Johnson's. My God, the hotels are there. The, the restaurants are gone. There's nostalgia there as well. But 
So how do Wait, you- Wait, I Sears, Ponderosa, Red Barn. Oh my gosh, Shoney's big boy is oh, around, Shoney's, but not yeah. big boys are gone. Big, boy, big boys, Mr. Steak. And and of course, and, yeah. And then of course, recent ones like Bennigan's and others, but it, it's a, for a different reason. So you do have, yeah. the brand equity, you have the brand equity, but you've got a generation of people who look fondly. Oh, really Holiday Inn. Fondly. Holiday Inn. Holiday Inn's right? out of the family. It's corporate owned. Yeah. But, but there's people who have sort of the nostalgia. They smile at the idea of it, but how do you invite them back while introducing it to a new generation? I know you are very cognizant that that is your primary challenge. And how do you be more than just a transient purchase? You know, it, I, I travel pretty extensively when there's not a worldwide pandemic. And I know I'm going to get a lower level of service at an airport restaurant yeah. because they know they're going to see you once and you're going to be gone. You might come back if it's a Chili's 2 or Chili's to go. You know that they're still connected to the, uh, the, the national brand. But most of them, you're just there and you're transient and you're gone. There was a great quote online from your grandfather that talked about that, that, that you have a chance to um, revisit a relationship if something goes wrong for somebody you know, but at Stucky's, you may have that one chance. One <laughs> so, chance. Right, so it, it's a longer question, but how do you do reintroduce it for those who smile and love their experience? I'm one of those people. Um, while also uh, introducing to a new generation. So you're more than just kitsch. You're more than just the 50s yeah. theme diner with Flo and, and, and the Gunther Tooties kind of a thing. Yeah, kiss my grits, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Okay, so first of all, I am learning every day. So I definitely would welcome your thoughts on this as well. And listeners, I'm sure they can post and give feedback. I'm, I'm constantly listening and learning. I... I Think I'm very different than most CEOs in that I, I didn't get an MBA. I'm very aware that Stuckey's is probably the only company I would ever be CEO of or want to be CEO of. So I'm learning. I right. definitely have enough, a enough self deprecating, approach. right? Enough self deprecating. Approach. Right. But tell yeah. me about that. Well, because I'm saying also... that just to say I have a very <clears throat> different background and I, right. but, but I'm taking thing. that back and applying it. And that background in large part is politics. Even before I was in elected office, I worked on campaigns, I worked yeah. in government. And what I learned from politics, very telling right now of what's going on with the political climate in this country, you shore up your base. You start with your base. You don't forget your base going off, yep. looking at some bright, shiny object. And no disrespect. I love millennials. I love Gen Zers. My, I guess my kids are Gen Zers or teenagers, but love that generation. But I'm not off chasing millennials right now. I would love to have them. I welcome everyone in our stores. But, but it's a phase two. Stucky's base is the pecan log roll. We're a candy company. Yep. And it's people 45, I'll go a little lower. 45, age 45 and up, that remember stopping in our heyday. So I am shoring up that base. I'm telling them we're still around. We're making a comeback. We want you to be part of our comeback story. Come back to Stuckey's. Remember us. Remember what it was like stopping as a kid. Help us revive that. And then I'm going to bring in the others. But I first got to, I, I can't get in a, I'm just not constantly out there trying to appeal to a younger generation. Now, having said that, I'm very mindful of things that matter to younger generations. And frankly, they matter to all generations, but you are seeing with people in, a, in, in their 20s and 30s and early 40s, they care about corporate ethics. They care about, do you have diversity in your workforce? Are you, are you sustainable? Well, heck, that's my background. I know how to be an environmentally certified company. I've definitely spent a whole career working on environmental issues. Do you have a strong sense of culture? So those things matter to us. And I think by just having a strong sense of who we are and what our brand is and sticking to that and not trying to be something we're not, we're going to start getting people interested and excited. And I don't care what age you are, you're going to love the concept of 
a brand making a comeback of all those companies you listed, none of them are making a comeback. And I no, would love if there's the another company out there. I want to, I want to hear about them and I want to connect with them that was run by your family, you know, created a brand that was known and then fell out of family hands and got back in family hands. Yeah. Well, we had talked that about this a little happen. bit before, right? We talked about that's a story that I don't care what demographic you are. That's a story. Right. But, but, it's also your story, which it is my you, story. It, yeah. gives, it gives you standing. Yeah. It gives you gravitas. This is literally you have a dog in this race because your name is on that. So let's talk about engaging the core audience. This is the, the classic 2080 rule, right? That 20% of the of the audience is going to constitute 80% of your revenue. You are very clear yeah. on who that is. But you are, yeah. to your credit, you are engaging them um, in today's terms. Even your yeah. Your your diary of your travels around the South and around the country visiting, it's on uh, it's on LinkedIn, it's on social media. You're blogging about those nostalgic kinds of things. I love the blog that you did about the magic fingers, the the yeah, the you, beds you put, you put in the bed. It just because I'm one of those guys. I'm 57. I remember all of that stuff. Yeah. You, you look back and you just laugh. My mom put dippity do and Aquanet in her hair and and. I love that stuff and it's fun. You had but, an etch a sketch, right? Light bright. Sketch. I mean, so I, get to, yeah. so I get to you really quickly. So I, I, I was, at, I was in, in Washington, D.C., and there was a place in the Reston Town Center called, it was a, like a baby boomer store, right? And it had slinkies and all that kind of stuff. So I bought my son, who, who was, I think, six at the time. I bought him an etch a sketch and I was pretty damn good at that. I mean, I'll just, all modesty aside, I was pretty yeah. good. You can write letters yeah. and diagonal lines. I just, you know, not to Before brag. Before the internet, that's what we did. <laughs> but I, I, I gave it to my son who was six at the time and he just kept turning it over and turning it over. And I said, what are you doing? He says, where do you turn it on? I said, dude, you don't turn it on. He says, well, how do you, right? He had no idea. He was playing with a, I had an old fashioned typewriter in my office and he says, and he's typing on, he says, where's the, um, um, where's the monitor? I said, there is no monitor. You put paper in it. He says, it's a printer. I said, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. So this part makes us smile. Stuckies makes people yeah. smile, but let's talk about engagement. Let's talk yeah. about what are you doing from um, an internal perspective in terms of facilities? How much say do you have in a limited financial capacity environment? Let's yeah. just be honest. And what is it that somebody's going to experience so that they do come back or they do 10 miles or 50 miles down the road want to stop at another one? What are we going to see today that will harken back to the past, but also recognizes the realities of our changing expectations? Yeah, so that is the biggest challenge I face. Yes, it's a huge challenge. How do you revive a nostalgic brand in a way that's relevant to today's consumers? But I consider my largest challenge how to renovate the brick and mortar locations that we have. We have 67 locations. Of that, only 20 are traditional brick and mortar stores. The others are the stores within the store. And as I referenced earlier, the problem we have is that during that decade when there was really no strong management or leadership of Stuckey's, the team that was there out of necessity put Stuckey's in stores that frankly don't elevate the brand. But at the current time, we need the revenue that we get from the franchise fees. So we're keeping them there, but we have very little control. We have no corporate owned stores. So my goal is to ideally have 20 corporate owned stores that are really nice, that have an experience, you know, that talk about the experience economy. And I think that is definitely a way to appeal to a younger demographic, but also to an older demographic too. Who doesn't want to pull over and have a retail experience that's special and unique and different. Everyone wants that. So, but so I, what? So, what are you going to do in terms of? There. Sorry, I don't. I don't mean to interrupt, but but yeah. in doing that, is the plan to create a prototype in that first corporate yes. store and yeah. taking the best of what we remember, maybe from an architectural perspective, yeah. but in terms of the food and the update, and using that as the training exactly. center and sort of the, the traditional yeah. franchise model. 
There you go. You just you just said it. That's that's our goal. But before we can get to that goal, we have to have capital. So how do yeah? This this is it's chicken with the egg in it. The number one challenge for any business, and I joke that Stuckey's is an eighty year old startup. Yep. Startups especially access to capital. So how do you get capital? When I started Stuckey's. I thought, all right, I'm going to take a crash course in entrepreneurship and I'm going to watch every single episode of Shark Tank and, yeah, and the, the profit. profit. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Marcus Lemonis, I love you. Yeah. Uh, so Best I've ever. seen all those episodes. And then, so I'm like, all right, I just need an investor. Well, first of all, you got to have a good fit with an investor. And investors want control, they often want equity. I am extremely reluctant to do that given the history of Stuckey's and how we fell out of family hands and lost what made us special. Yeah, you and you want a stronger loans. hand. You want to be in a stronger position before you, want, you bring in those partners right? or they yeah. are going to come over. Marcus Lemonis is my hero and right. he will come over and take over. He will be a hundred percent in He'll charge. Take over. Yeah. And so, there's but, nothing but, wrong with that. You've just got to expect that and you you've got to be okay that. with that. But, I'm but not okay with that. Marcus Lamonis, I'm not okay with that. <laughs> but talk about your runway. How, how do you, what's the timeline? You've been on yeah. this job for about a year. Yeah. Let's use legislative terms. Is there a sunset provision for some of these stores within a stores that are in, in inadvisable locations that you can ultimately transition out when you replace that yeah. revenue stream? What's the, what's the model and the plan? Yeah, so what we are doing to get capital is, well, you can get capital through traditional loans and you have the control and you have to have obviously good credit. So that is a challenge for some investors. I'm very fortunate or some startups. I'm very fortunate that I've had a whole career. I have, I have good credit. And so I was able to get loans to help us with some of the expansion plans we have and we are very close to closing I, I and i was able to merge i got a business partner with a compatible company he has a pecan company and he's Great 15 synergy. years younger yeah. he is all about getting the younger demographic so that is also one strategy i have for expanding our customer base is i've got a partner who is constantly saying all right stephanie that's great i love your nostalgic stories but let's talk about yeah. the 30 somethings so i got a business partner and he and i are and he has a depth of knowledge in the pecan business or pecan however you want to say it and we mm -hmm. are about to acquire a manufacturing facility a pecan processing and a candy facility. So by the time this airs, we will have acquired it. It's a couple of weeks away. So that is how we're generating revenue is through our product, through the Stuckey's trademark, through the sale of our candy, through the sale of branded merchandise. And the strongest avenue for growth for us has been B2B, business to business, retail partners. Our perfect partner will be a small independent chain of maybe one to 50, up to 100 stores that will put us in their locations, not as a store within a store, but flat out wholesale to retail relationship. They'll sell our candy products. They'll sell our, our healthy nut snacks. That's how we're generating revenue. That is 70% of our revenue right now. That's what was my question is. is yeah, the, that's the, how we're percentage. generating revenue. It, so it, I am it, focusing it, strategically on how I know we can grow and generate revenue and be in a position of strength. Then we're in that position of strength and we're owning our own facility. So we're controlling the quality of the product. We're controlling the manufacturing and the prices are going to get a lot more competitive because we're not having our product outsourced. We're making it ourselves. We're cutting the cost and we're, we're processing the pecans and then we're putting them in the product all in-house. So we're becoming more vertically integrated. Then we're selling in the retail outlets that we have a relationship with that are, are branded as our stores and we're selling to our B2B customers. So we're going to generate enough revenue from that to be in a position where we can either attract capital in a way that's going to be a positive relationship, not a sort of power relationship where we're on the, the yep. lower end of the pecking order. And we will be in a position where we could grow slower, a little more organically using our own capital.
because we'll be generating our own revenue. Sure. Now, having said that, you got to be in a position that you don't want to take a lot of dividends or, you know, you're not, I'm not, I won't be taking a big salary. I'll be reinvesting in the company. Right. You know, and you that's see, what you, you get, those, frankly, those... with a family brand is that you, you are invested in the brand. And so I will want to reinvest in the company. It's, it's, it's my heritage. You know, for our listeners and our and our viewers, first of all, we're talking talking to Stephanie Stuckey from uh, the famous Stuckey's Roadside Restaurant, Pecan Logs, Stop for the Restroom, <laughs> everything else. But you know, you see those comics, those little memes that show what everybody thinks success is, and it's that 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 big J curve, and the reality is it's it's a squiggly line, and it's going over chasms yes. and fire and everything else. This is, it's a daunting task. And so not everybody's up to it. Not everybody survives all of this. But I think when you talk about some of that vertical integration, I think you saw a lot of that with your grandfather, what he did, he yeah. owned the trucking company, he owned the Pecan, he owned the billboards for crying out he loud. He owned a billboard company. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that talk Man, about- Man, I the, wish we had that. The, the ultimate <laughs> in, in, integration for all that. But, but let's do one last thing here. Well, in the time that we have, how do you mobilize an army of fans how are you? I mean, I'm seeing what you're doing on the site. I think your 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 website is gorgeous. Uh, the color refresh is great. There's there's venues and vehicles for people to share their stories. How do you go yeah. beyond and that traditional hub and spoke model? How do you go to all those hubs so they tell theirs and they tell others? How do you incentivize that? How do you get them to share? When when I was a kid, when we were kids, and I'm older than you, um, you go but to the not pizza, much. We go I'm to the right pizza. Behind the pizza place or whatever. And there would be the bulletin board with all of the yeah. Polaroid pictures, right? Yeah. Of who, who ate the challenge pizza or the softball team that was, well, that's now Instagram, right? And it's, yeah. and it's Pinterest and it's TikTok. And how do you take it to a new generation and expand beyond even reinforcing that 20% who knows and loves you and remembers you? How do you engage them and mobilize that army of fans. What are you doing today? What's the plan for that? Well, like I said earlier, I'm still learning. So I, I welcome feedback on this. I think the best marketing is word of mouth marketing. Yeah. You're, you're not marketing. You're not, you're not the only person out there hustling for your company. Like you said, you have brand ambassadors all over the country that believe in your brand. So how you make that happen, I'm still figuring it out where I found success is that I believe in my brand. And I know authenticity gets thrown out all the time to the point that it has lost meaning, yep. I think in some ways, but I am gonna use authenticity because what I put out there is our story. It is who we are. And I'm, I try to put out content that starts a conversation. Every time I put out content, I think, is this something I would want to talk about? Or is this something that can spark a dialogue? So I'm not just going to say pecan log rolls on sale this week. That's not starting a conversation. It's not. I'm, I'm going to say, <clears throat> did you know that our, I think I just held it upside down. So, but did you know that our pecan log rolls uh, we're started because my grandfather was sitting out in the hot summer sun one day and got the inspiration to start selling candy. My grandmother didn't know what she was doing. Her six sisters and her got in the kitchen. They found an old family recipe for pecan log rolls and, and they put maraschino cherries in it, which is what makes ours different. You know, you, you tell a story and then you hope people connect with that story. And, you know, like how my grand, I, I don't talk about, oh, you should see all the billboards we have, or you should, you should go out and stop at Stucky's. I, I don't say go stop at Stucky's. I say, hey, do you know the story about how far my grandfather, how he figured out how far apart to space his doors? To I tell the, the story. Well, story. listen, I, I think you're, yeah. I think you're, you, you tell are. tell the story. Yeah, you're, the you're story's real. Yeah, it is real. I think you you're don't make it up. <laughs> self-deprecating and humble but the reality i think you're doing it i mean it caught my attention i mean the reason that we're talking today is because someone said you need to follow yeah. this woman she does pretty and it's the old stuckies and i smiled and i started reading and it yep. is stories and it's checking in and you are diligent in checking in daily with something interesting that's my whole mantra if you want people to be interested you oh have my gosh. interesting so i encourage everybody 
yeah. who is listening to this or watching it on my on my website or on my YouTube channel, look up Stephanie Stuckey. Look up the website at Stuckey's.com. It's Stuckey with an E-Y. Follow her and connect with her on LinkedIn just to follow the journey. And this is what I appreciate about this. I'm not interviewing you know, Nike and, and, and Apple. And it's the journey is what is interesting. The journey mm -hmm. is what is the challenge that gives us a commonality for the people, the entrepreneurs and others who watch this or listen to this who recognize that this is hard. It's, it's the, it's the whole core yeah. of the e-myth. One of my, the seminal books for me from Michael Gerber, the myth of the entrepreneur is that we're standing on a, on a cliff with a trench coat and that noble and the, and the sun beyond. No, the reality is the 60, 80 hours a week and, and the struggles of where the next yeah. dollar is coming from. But not everybody has the resilience um, and the fortitude yeah. to, to go through this. So, so big props to you. And I hope we have a chance to reconnect along the journey as well, because it's, it's fascinating and I'm a big fan. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, this is an exciting day for us. I think I said earlier before we went on, we're launching our Stuckey's beer today, our pecan beer. So Another thing I'm doing, look, just branching out and as well. trying things. Yeah. yeah. So it's and been look, an and honor. Look at the if, if they want to connect with you, what's, what's the best way to do it? If somebody has an interest LinkedIn. in a franchise or LinkedIn, best way to do it. Yeah, but I'm on um, Twitter and Instagram as Stucky Stop. Stuck, so, stop, got it. Well, we'll throw it in. We'll throw it in the show notes as well. Yeah. Hang with me for a second. Here's my my closing. Here, uh, remind everybody my new customer experience book, "Why Customers Leave and How to Win Them Back," was named in Forbes as one of their top ten business books of the year and one of the seven books that entrepreneurs need to read. Uh, you can pick it up everywhere. Also in multiple languages. Just came out in Russian. And in India and in Spanish, it's coming out in Vietnamese and everything's kind of crazy. And this podcast is sponsored in part by the Customer Experience Advantage Morning Huddle. Listen, some of the best ideas, some of the best solutions to your biggest customer facing challenges are likely found within the creative minds of your own team. Let me lead your weekly morning huddle conversation. You can learn more about membership in this powerful internal initiative by visiting CustomerExperienceAdvantage.com. Be sure to click to like this podcast, subscribe, leave your comments below, click the little bell icon and you'll receive notifications of new episodes. Also, of course, I'd love to come and present for you and your group and your meeting and your conference. You can learn more about my in-person speaking or my live virtual speaking during the pandemic and my consulting at davidaverin.com. This is the Customer Experience Advantage podcast. I am thrilled and thank you, Stephanie Stuckey, for joining us here today. Um, and I just want to remind you, it's not really about creating wow moments. Not everybody's business uh, lends itself to wow moments. Business success today is really about being an easy choice, being a better choice, and being remarkably easy to do business with. I am David Averin. Be good. Thanks. This has been the Customer Experience Advantage Podcast with David Averin. Feel free to leave a comment and be sure to hit the thumbs up button. You can listen to past episodes and be notified of future ones by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. David's popular marketing and customer experience books are available in print as well as Kindle and audiobook and published in multiple languages around the world. You can stay connected and learn more at davidaverin.com. Thanks for tuning in.